So again, this is, if you will, us kind of traversing up the mountain to, to get a little closer to our Lord Jesus. If you were with us last Sunday, we talked about at the end of this, the message, uh, sometimes our love for God um, is impeded um, by stumbling blocks of unanswered faith questions. And so you were invited to bring forth your questions and and uh, <laughs> you did that. We ended up with almost 100 questions. <laughs> so uh, just from a math point, I mean, you can do the math, right? As far as how much time we would have per question. Um, not enough. Not enough. Yeah, exactly, not enough. Uh, but we're going to get through it in a, in a, creative, in a creative way. Uh, so, yeah, so formally we close out the series uh, today. If you didn't get a chance to read the book or be with us, go back, pick it up, call Half Truth from Adam Hamilton. Uh, it, it definitely helps us grow in our faith and to turn those half-truths into whole truths. So I, I really hope that you appreciated this sermon series. It's crazy that we're already at the seventh and final week. Well, we close with Matthew 7, where we were last week, um, just a couple of verses later. We're in verses 7 and 8. Uh, this is Jesus speaking when he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to those who knocks, the door will be opened. And so today is all about us asking, seeking, and knocking. And... That's what our faith journey really is about, faith-seeking understanding. And so we will try to answer your faith questions. And what we've, what we've done is we've categorized them into nine different categories based on the questions that you have. And so that's one way that we will try to tackle this is um, more so pointing to uh, that theme or that topic. So if you don't hear your particular question, listen for that overall all theme, all right? Uh, let's pray. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks and praise for your Holy Spirit in this place and all places. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will remain as we uh, just talk about our faith and, uh, and about you and uh, how you move in our lives and in this world. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so the first one is about theodicy. We got uh, 17 questions about this, and I truly think this is one of the stumbling blocks to people believing in in a God. And theodicy tries to reconcile uh, a loving God, all-powerful God, with all the evil and suffering sin in the world. Uh, theos meaning God and uh, DK uh, meaning justice. So theodicy is justifying God. How do we justify that there is such a God in the midst of everything that we see and experience in this world? And so again, we have a lot of questions around this. Why is there so much evil? You got natural disasters. Why are the, the hurricanes? Why do good things happen? Good, all of those type of questions. Well, let me start with free will. Uh, in God's love and God's uh, uh, infinite wisdom, God gave us freedom. We had to have that freedom in order to have and be in and maintain authentic, genuine, loving relationships. And as we read quickly <laughs> into the book, Genesis 3 uh, is the fall, right? And so once uh, the fall, uh, sin has entered into the world and corrupted all of God's good gifts, every single one of them. Uh, and so when it comes to what's the intention of loving, harmonious, peaceful relationships, now hate, violence, discord, dissension, right? Uh, and so it's easier, I think, to get to moral evil, um, we have the freedom to do whatever we would want uh, to one another, right? Uh, natural evil is not as easy uh, when we have disease or cancer or natural disasters or what we really could call natural events. Uh, the disaster part comes in because of humanity and some of the decisions that we make where we build or how we develop things. And so natural events such as uh, hurricanes and that sort of, sort of thing, they're not evil in and of themselves, right? The disaster part comes in when there's a mix as to where humanity uh, has made some choices, right? 
I think in general, what this question is really getting at is, why does God allow suffering and evil? And let me just tell you that we don't know. <laughs> There's theologians, we've thought about this uh, throughout history. Humanity has thought about this through history. And there really is no satisfying answer. But what we do know is uh, there's a God called Emmanuel, God with us. And so when you think about theodicy, the answer to theodicy, um, and this is not just a flippant answer. The true and real profound answer is Jesus Christ. God did not remain far off in the heavens uh, as a watchmaker God that just set it uh, in motion and then disappeared. No, God said, I am coming down in the midst of the sin, of the, in the suffering, and I'm going to do something about it. And so when we talk about Jesus dying on the cross, uh, yes, it's for our personal sins, but it's for the, the sum, it's beyond the sum total of all of our individual sins added up. Jesus defeats sin and suffering and evil, and it's because he goes to the cross for us, he is able to, from the inside, redeem it. And remember, a couple of weeks ago, everything happens for a reason. We see that he's able to pull good out of it. And so when we as the church continue to be God's hands and feet in this world, we are continually being the answer to the suffering in this world. And so when we talk about our food pantry and vulnerable children and working for housing and home, that is us being an answer to suffering in this world. Paul says in Romans 8.18, I believe that the present suffering is nothing compared to the coming glory that is going to be revealed to us. And so this gives me comfort to know that the God that has created all good things, that has created everything, God knows that God has the power to give us whatever is promised to us on the other side of this life. And only that God can make it something that our present suffering can't compare to. All right? All right. So our next series of questions, almost a dozen of them, were about discernment or God's will. And so Corey touched briefly about um, God's will. But there were um, several questions that were specifically addressing uh, God's will for our lives. How do we differentiate between God's will versus our own will? Um, knowing whether or not we're hearing from God. Are we actually hearing from God or is that us? figuring out how to listen to God, and knowing when and how to respond. And so I think that Jesus gave us the answer to this one when he told his disciples that he was going away, but that he was going to send them a helper, right? A counselor and a comforter to help guide them. This is the Holy Spirit who lives within each one of us, encouraging us and convicting us to become more like Christ, to become um, more like the image of Christ that we were created to be. So when we say yes to God, or when our parents or our guardians say yes on our behalf at our baptism, like we witnessed this morning, we are filled with the Holy Spirit, um, baptized by water and the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit just makes herself at home inside of us and just kind of spreads her wings out and just makes herself at home and just kind of crowds out all the stuff we're not supposed to want to say and think and do. Um, and the Holy Spirit does this by conviction. We're nudged to do the right things. If we pay attention, if we're aware, then we know it, right? Um, sometimes we try to shrug it off, but it doesn't go away. The Holy Spirit is persistent. Um, she's like your sacred conscience, if you want like a, maybe a, a, a holy Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> um, or like the cartoons when you have like an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other and you have them wrestling back and forth what you should do, you know, right? You know which one it is. Sometimes God, through the Holy Spirit, is really, really loud, and you know right away what it is that you're supposed to do. And sometimes God is really, really quiet, and it takes us a little longer, and we wrestle. Sometimes God is actually silent for a lot longer than we would really like God to be. But the more time that we spend with God, not just talking, but listening, the more that we'll be able to sense what God is calling us to do and to think and to be. And that happens mostly through prayer, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes. Spending time in that communion and conversation with God helps us to discern if and when God is speaking and what makes sense um, for God to say to us. 
We can test whether or not something is contrary to what we know about God because of the time that we spend with God and the more that we know about God. So does this thing that I think I'm being called to, is it good? Is it helpful? Um, is it ch characteristic of the way that Jesus lived? Does it show love for God and for others? Does it embody any of the fruit of the Spirit? Does it bring us or others closer to God? And these are good questions to ask, to ask ourselves when trying to discern God's will. Because one of the things about that is like, like I've spent a really long time with Gary, so I know I can anticipate what he's going to say, what he's going to do when we're in a certain situation. I have spent less time but three years with Corey, and I can anticipate what you are going to say or what you're going to do in a situation, right? I can right. probably say it with him, or maybe if his back is turned, I can say it, like, under my breath. I know what he's going to say, right? I do that with Gary, too, so don't worry. Um, they both know that. Um, <laughs> But that's what it is when we have that relationship with God, that God is so close to us that we can anticipate those kinds of things. It is hard to have a relationship with someone that we spend no time at all with. But once we spend time with God, like we spend time with our loved ones and we can anticipate what they say, we will then begin to learn what it is that God would say to us. Thank you. Good answer. And as we spend time with God, we... We, we, we transform, right? It's Transfiguration Sunday. So as we spend time closer to God, we, we change ourselves and, and we become more holy. And there were a group of questions based around, these were the I questions, right? These were based around personal growth and personal holiness. And John Wesley said there are two types of holiness. There's personal holiness and social holiness. And, and this group of questions resolved around the personal. And this personal holiness, this is our, our, our sanctification. This is, this is how we live our lives to become more like Christ. This is how we become more like the, the God that we proclaim and the, the Christ that we claim to follow. So these questions, they, 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 they kind of ran all over the place, but they all had that I theme. How do I change? How do... I spend more time with God? How do, how do I learn patience? I'll tell you that answer to that one in a couple weeks. <laughs> how can I stop being judgmental? Questions like that. But, but I would say, for those who are seeking how do I become closer to God, be intentional. Set time on your calendar and your phone, on your, your, your whatever, however you do that. Be intentional. Block it out. Block out time to spend time with God. Like Nicole said, if you want to become closer to God, you have to spend time with God in a quiet place or in a room full of people. They're both valid and they both work. And then there's questions on how do I stop being judgmental? And the answer to that is the same as getting to know God. Get to know your neighbor. Get to know your, the, the people that you find yourselves being judgmental over. When you love someone, it's more difficult to judge them. So learn to love. Grow to love people. And then how, the one question that says, why do I do the things that I shouldn't do? And why do I struggle so much to do what is right? You're human. We're people. Paul struggled with this his entire life. Mostly after he woke up on the road and he couldn't see but it's okay. It's okay to struggle. Lean on God for those answers. And then questions like, how do I become stronger in my Christian faith? And how do I deal with skepticism? I would just say, continue to answer those nudgings. 
God is pursuing you. God is wooing you. God is calling you. The Holy Spirit is working in you every single minute of your life. And that Spirit is transforming you, and it is changing you, and it takes time. And that's where the patience comes in. Rely on God. Well, he talks about the struggling, and so that is where God's forgiveness comes in. Uh, From Genesis to Revelation, what God is uh, eradicating from the world and from our lives is sin. And and God is offering forgiveness uh, through Jesus Christ. So there were some questions around this. Uh, How can I keep my faith and love my neighbor when I have hurt in my heart? Well, I would say try to figure out the source of the hurt, and that's going to depend on the severity of the hurt. And so that's going to take some self some self care work. Um, I would encourage uh, counseling. Uh, we have a counseling center here for David Lewis uh, right here on campus. Uh, exercise and then attend to the uh, the spiritual disciplines. Yes, be in worship. Connect with other Christian believers uh, in fun ways. Have them speak into your life. Uh, take time to uh, yes, read scripture and pray. Uh, as they say, take it to God in prayer. Serve others. Uh, and I think through that, uh, you will not only uh, start to figure out the, the source of the hurt, but also the source of your healing. That is God. And as we talked a couple weeks ago, pray and work. And so pray about it and ask God, how can God possibly re- uh, use this, redeem it, uh, to bring healing uh, unto, unto others? How can I forgive myself truly? I know I'm forgiven. How do I let go of the, forgive, uh, the, the regret and shame? How do I accept forgiveness? I would say in some ways you have. In some ways you have. You keep showing up. You keep coming to the table of forgiveness, uh, the table of communion. You pray. You see, Hebrews tells us in 1031, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so if you are coming into the presence of God, That's the work of forgiveness. That's the work of grace in your life. Otherwise, we would want nothing to do with being in God's presence. And so uh, uh, accept God's acceptance of you. And I know sometimes it's, it's hard, and I've prayed with some of you at the altar on this very thing, but God loves us. God loves you. You are forgiven. If we do not believe that, we are not truly embracing uh, the truth and the power of Jesus' sacrificial death and resurrection. That's what it's all about because God knows we are human and we struggle. And so accept that forgiveness um, that is offered to you. How do I love someone who hurts me? Well, I would say love your neighbor as yourself. And so that means it is so uh, truly okay and it is really a commandment to love yourselves. And loving yourself means saying no to being hurt intentionally. You see, it is okay to say no to things that are inappropriate that would cause you harm. And so, yes, try and love while speaking up for yourself and what you deserve, which is to be treated with dignity and respect, right? If, uh, um, then it talks about uh, the, the relationship between us receiving forgiveness and us not forgiving others and if we would not go to heaven. Well, Matthew 18, 21 through 25 does speak about this, this the parable of the unforgiving or the uh, unmerciful servant. But I don't think it's a tit for tat that God is walking around with a clipboard for each one of us like, oh, oh little Johnny didn't forgive Becky on that one, and that God is collecting those, right? I think what Jesus is telling us and what the Spirit is saying to us is, did we seek, do we seek to exemplify God's love and mercy or do we try to withhold it, right? Uh, Do we accept God's love for us and do we then share it? Or do we treat others as if there is no loving, forgiving, gracious God, right? Uh, Do we keep others in their bondage of sin? Um, Are we going to withhold that forgiveness from them. But if we know all the things that we struggle with and suffer or, you know, that we've grown through, are we allowing personal holiness to bring us to a place where we extend 
that love and forgiveness to others. But it is not a tit for tat to where we get to the pearl and gates and like, oh, you forgave 99 people, but that last one, that was a problem. And uh, sorry about your luck. That's, so look at it as, are you a vessel for God's love and grace and forgiveness uh, in this world? And so our next one was actually, it was only a, a couple of questions, but it was um, really the same question. And while forgiveness is definitely one of those things that will bring you to your knees, it's either because you are crying out in prayer or you're praying for the strength and the courage to forgive, right? So these questions, we had several questions about prayer, uh, mostly about how it works. Um, why do some prayers seem to get answered while others don't? And honestly, Prayer is a tough one. It's a, it's a tough one to understand. It's even tougher to explain. There isn't an easy answer um, to this one. Prayer is a beautiful and a holy mystery. Um, and trusting in the power of prayer does take some faith. Um, but so does believing in a God that we can't see. So does following Jesus who lived over 2,000 years ago in a different time and a different place. And so is relying on the Holy Spirit who lives and breathes inside of us. So prayer is the way that we commune and we converse with God. God wants to hear from us. Isn't that crazy? God wants to hear from each and every one of us. Even though God already knows what's in our hearts and what's on our minds, God loves for us to just climb up into God's lap, right, and just nestle there anytime, any place, anywhere, whatever, and share our lives, share our dreams and our, our desires and our disappointments, everything about our lives. And because conversation is a two-way street, God also wants us to listen, right? And to listen, a lot of times we listen because we're, we're already thinking about what we want to say next. God just wants us to listen, be still and know. This is the harder part because we can feel like we're talking to ourselves sometimes. Um, and that quiet part, it can be uncomfortable at first, but it's only uncomfortable at first. When you do it over and over again, it gets easier and easier. And sometimes our minds wander, right? So it's good to have a word or a phrase, Jesus, be still and know, whatever it is to kind of center you back to, to, to what you're doing, to what you're focusing on, to listening to God, being in that listening posture. Um, I have a monkey mind when it comes to prayer. So you like, mine goes over here? Nope, let me bring it back here and let me focus on listening to what God has to say to me. And we can get so caught up in God, what, what we're worried about, what, it, how is God answering? We're so caught up in God answering that we forget that, that prayer is not all about asking right? We have the Acts prayer. And, you know, one of our earliest children's moment. I know, Corey, you did that a couple of years ago, our Acts prayer. Adoration, gracious, loving, merciful God. Um, I love you. You're awesome. Confession. I messed up last week. I didn't do the thing that I know that you really wanted me to do. I am so sorry. Thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for loving me in spite of all of my faults and failures. And then, and then finally, after those three Finally then, supplication. Here's the stuff that I'm dealing with. This is what I'm wrestling with. I need your help, right? The smallest part of our prayers is when we ask for stuff. So we don't come to God with a list of demands. We lay our requests before God and we ask for God's help. And I think I've shared this with y'all before. Um, it's something that our family does. In the sitcom, The King of Queens, uh, Doug tries to explain to Carrie that God is not a personal genie. And he says, this does not equal this. <laughs> and we don't just pray when we come to the end of ourselves, although we definitely do that. Jesus modeled for us what it is to go to God. Go to God first, go to God often, go to God last, at all times, in all places, in all ways. And Paul reminds us to pray continually and to give thanks always. And prayer absolutely works. Hear that. Prayer absolutely works. I believe it with all that I am. I can't tell you how or why or what or when, but I know that I know that I know that prayer works, that God answers prayer, that God doesn't always answer prayer the way that I want God to answer prayer. That's the part about God's will, my will, you know, that whole thing. But that doesn't mean that our prayers go unanswered, and it definitely doesn't mean that our prayers go unheard, right? 
God answers prayer in amazing, miraculously, crazy, beautiful ways. And God also answers prayer quietly, right? Invisibly, subtly. God's ways are higher than our ways. So sometimes we don't get to know how or why or when or all of those things. Just know that it doesn't mean we didn't pray hard enough or long enough or well enough. That's not even a thing, right? Prayer changes us and God changes us. And sometimes God uses us as an answer to someone else's prayer. Along with how does prayer work, many of you wanted to know how the Bible works. How does scripture work? And I was afraid as we did this that there would be a lot of those stump the pastor questions like uh, what was the name of the third cousin twice removed from the centurion's half brother? Thank you for not asking those questions. But the questions that we did get were about interpretation and understanding of the scriptures. One of the questions was with all the different interpretations, all the different CEBs, NIVs, LMNOPs of the Bible out there, how do I know which one works? Which one is right? How do I know which one to read? And the answer to that is so simple. Read the version that you will read. It doesn't matter if it's common English or Old English, or Swahili, or Greek. The words of the Bible are true, and there is truth in those words that will change your life. So read whichever one you'll read, read multiple versions, and take even go back to the original Greek and Hebrew if you really want a good challenge, and there are a lot of good tools out there that can help you do that to figure out why the two versions may sound a little bit different. One of the questions was, should I only pay attention to the red letters in the Bible? No. The red letters are super important because in some translations, in some Bibles, not all, the red letters are the words of, of, of Jesus himself. But we also need to pull from the Psalms. We also need to pull from what the gospel writers were saying about Jesus and Paul's letters, the entire work is an inspired work of God. So pay attention to the whole thing. And then, should we be interpreting the Bible for today, for our culture, our culture today? I say yes but not just our culture, for, for all culture. Think of it in terms of context. The Bible was written for you, but it wasn't written necessarily to you. It was written to a group of people over 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago. But it was written with the, the intent, God knew that you would be hearing these words today. So as we take that context in, the Bible was true back in 300. The Bible was true in 1500. It's true today, and it will still be true a thousand years from now. Amen. And then somebody asked if, if Paul were here today, would he write a letter to us? You bet he would. <laughs> and what would that letter say? Hard to tell, but I think that letter would tell us to stop following false gods and to follow Jesus and to love one another the way Jesus told us to love one another. All right, we got three more questions. Uh, can we have a, will y'all give us five, give, raise your hand if you'll give us extra five minutes. Five, 10, 15, 20, oh, we got plenty of time. We got, we got plenty of time. Okay, we're good. We're good, all right. <clears throat> Salvation. Salvation. Uh, what we say the Bible is, is it's a book that contains all things necessary for our salvation, meaning the truth of the Bible points to the truth of Jesus Christ. And so uh, when it comes to salvation, one person said, why is it important to be desirous of eternal life? Uh, for me, I would say uh, it's the better alternative to not existing 
Um, we get to meet our creator. I, I can't wait for that moment to, as Paul talks about, fully knowing as we are fully known, uh, being able to see our past loved ones and to be at the heavenly banquet, uh, which we get a foretaste in and through uh, communion. Uh, so uh, just to behold all the promises uh, that God has in store for us that our minds can't even conceive of. Of course, when it gets to salvation, we talk about who's in, who's out. Is it only people that believe in Jesus that are going to go to heaven? Um, well, there's three, uh, let's say, three ways to look at this uh, spectrum. Universalist means everybody's getting in. Everybody. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have exclusivists. They exclude everyone that ha has not prayed the sinner's prayer. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Uh, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. But they exclude everyone that has not prayed that prayer. I land, uh, and I call myself an inclusivist, somewhere in the middle where we, uh, we would say God can offer and give the atoning grace of Jesus Christ through the cross and resurrection. God can offer that grace to anyone God wants to. And so think about those that came before Christ. Think about those that are maybe in a different world religion. There's still over 1,500 languages that do not have a Bible in their native tongue. All right, think about that. There's over 1,500 languages that do not have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so some people have never heard of Jesus. What is God going to do there? Then you have stillborns and infants and children. You have those that are mentally incapable of knowing anything about faith. God can, uh, God can offer that grace to whomever God chooses. Uh, there was one question in here about are good deeds enough to repent for our sins? I would say that as John 15 says and as John the Baptist says, our good deeds are proof of our repentance. You know, John the Baptist says, let your good fruit be the proof that you have repented. Um, there's a question in here about that Jesus preached in hell. As a United Methodist, we would say he descended into hell. That's just to say that there's no aspect of all of creation, of all of existence that Jesus cannot touch. Obviously, there's no way for us to know what dead means or what Jesus, uh, how dead meant for him between uh, the cross and Resurrection Sunday. Uh, but just know that whatever hell we go through here on earth, Jesus can find you there as well. Can all faiths unite as one? I mean, we can do good works together, but we all have different beliefs and uh, different motivations based on our religion. Uh, and then you have just different religions in general. Um, I would say, again, uh, Jesus his grace can be applied to anyone. And really, what I want to say about salvation is, as I read a long time ago, you have to love God more than you fear hell. Okay? So our salvation is not about avoiding fire or fire insurance. It's about having a living fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. And someone in here asked about their sexuality, about being gay and they truly believing that God created them that way, but then why would God condemn them to hell. And so what I would say to that person, to whoever asked, and to all of us, you are a beloved child of our Lord. Um, you are created in God's image like all people are. And so what I would say is there's something about your consciousness, right? And if, if you are right with God, you are right with God. But don't let, as we talked about last week, don't let others' judgment and their condemnation uh, let that be a stumbling block to you growing in your love for God and your love for others. As far as who's in and who's out, we can do all the math equations we want to and try to figure that out, but we don't know, and we won't know, so we'll leave that to God. What we're called to do is love others now and always. Does, does that make sense? Salvation, salvation is loving others now. We believe in John 17, 3, that eternal life starts now and that is having an ongoing relationship through Jesus Christ. Salvation is not just what happens after physical death. It is living saved right now, right? I, I began with uh, personal holiness. I said that John Wesley said there were two types of holiness, and the other one is social holiness. And 
next group of questions deals around how do we deal with the world? How do we deal with hate? How do we deal with anger? And the, the simple response to that is, is that love overcomes hate. Hate is a void. Hate is a hole in God's universe that can only be filled with love. Hate is, a, hate is a big hole, just void of love, and that love comes in the form of us loving each other and loving God. And that's what social holiness is. It's, it's, it's how we express our love of God by the way we love those around us, how we love others. And somebody asked the question, how do you love somebody that is not good to you? And you can't force love. Just as, as God gives us free will, we have to acknowledge the free will of others and other people are going to do rotten things. It's just the way the world works. But all you can do is, is Remove yourself if you're in harm's way, and that is the most important step. If you're in harm's way, remove yourself. And after that, pray. Take that person in small doses and love them. Even though they're hard to love, you still have to love them. And then there's social issues like homelessness and hunger Somebody asks, how do we respond? We just respond. We just do. do. Do what that nudging that the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. If that Holy Spirit is leading you to, to, to feed somebody or give somebody a 20 standing on the corner or a 50 or 50 cents out of your ashtray. Do we still have that? Ashtrays in cars with money in them? <laughs> I don't know. But do what God is leading you to do. But I challenge you to go a step further. Do what you can do to prevent them from being in that place in the first place. Right? And then somebody asked if, if, uh, we, if, they, if we believe that uh, Jesus would be weeping at how we affect the world. And I think Jesus has been weeping at the way the church has been treating each other for a long time. Since the beginning. The disciples were arguing with each other in the beginning. We haven't stopped since. But I know we have to work on that. We have to continue to treat each other within the church with love and grace. And there's a, there's a story about a man who wants to change the world and he, he says, maybe I'll start with my country. He says, no, maybe it's my state. I'll, I'll change my state. No, maybe it's my city. Maybe it's my family. Maybe it's me. Right? It starts here and then goes out there. And then the question was asked, how do we get more families to, to want to bring their kids to church, to, to know that this is important? And I would just say simply be an example. Be an example of what you want other people to follow. Be the one that they want to follow. Be like Christ. So then we come to questions about, we, we kind of group these together as the journey of life, right? Because getting through life can be a challenge from birth to death. And we had a few questions in general about just our life's journey, the things that pop up along the way. So one of our questions was about inspiring children and teens and possibly young adults to become closer to God. So kind of piggybacking onto what Gary was saying about setting this example for the young, that is the best way to inspire others of any age uh, to get to know God, to see, have them watch you, what you're doing. Um, children especially, though, learn what they live. They learn by watching what we do, and they learn more by what they see than by what we say, right? Um, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, um, what you do speaks so loudly, I cannot hear what you are saying. 
Our younger generation has the world at its fingertips, right? 24-7, TikTok and, and Snapchat and, and, all, and, and uh, all of the Instagram and everything. They see so much out there that is superficial, right? But it's up to us to show them something that is real. I didn't always think that our kids were listening as they were growing up, but as they've gotten older, they've proved us otherwise in many ways. When we didn't think we could see anything blooming at all, they were, there were roots that were growing deep underneath the surface, right under our feet. And the example that we are living, that you are living, is not just for your own kids. Um, it really does take a village, five adults, for every one youth, and we have plenty of youth, plenty of children, youth here at Pasadena. So in our baptismal vows, right, this morning, we promised to come alongside Graceland. We promised to come alongside each one of our youth that were baptized. We promised to come alongside and say, we're going to proclaim the good news. We're going to live according to the example of Christ. We're going to pray for you, and we're going to surround you with love and forgiveness um, and that you would grow in service to others and that you would grow to become a true disciple, right? And as we grow, as we surround these youth, right, and as, and as they grow up, sometimes we start to wonder, they start to wonder about their worth, and that was one of our questions. Am I worthy enough? And if you've ever struggled with this question, know that I have struggled with that question too. And the answer is yes. Full stop. In fact, there's no enough because there's nothing we can do to earn our worth in God's eyes. Nothing at all. God knit us in our mother's wombs and knows each hair on our heads and wrote our names on the palms of God's hands. You are a child of God and that alone makes you worthy. You are worthy, period. And as time goes on, through this journey of life, we might ask ourselves, why do some folks seem to be more fortunate than others? Why, we may ask ourselves, well, will our own lives get better? And honestly, we just don't have enough time to unpack all of that, right? I know Corey was like 5, 10, 15, 20. We don't, we don't have enough time to unpack all of that. But there is so much of life that is beyond our control that what we need to be really intentional about is what we can control. And that sometimes is our perspective. Um, I just officiated on Friday night, I officiated one of my best friend's mom's funerals, and this woman faced multiple um, adversities in her life, um, the biggest of which uh, was being paralyzed from the waist down for over 20 years after a hiking accident. She developed back problems for six or seven years, and then dementia in the last two or three. And those are just the big ones that she faced, but she had more joy than most people I know. We see what we look for, and there is almost always something to be grateful for. And the more things that we count that we can be grateful for, the more that we will see. It's not always easy. I say that, and it sounds like, oh, pretty, whatever. It's not always easy. Um, but it does make a difference. It doesn't always change everything about our situation, but it might change our heart from the inside out, kind of like from me out to the rest of the world. And sometimes we do need more help than we have faith, and that's okay too. There are therapy, there, there is medications, like Corey said, we have a counseling center. It is okay to need Jesus and a therapist too, all right? Depression is real, and there is help. So for the regular valleys of life, we can still find joy. But if there's something bigger that you're struggling with, there are other options for you. So I don't want to gloss over that when we talk about this. We talked about questions about grief and comfort and how God comforts us. And God comforts us through other people when we are really going through the valley. God promises us we're going to walk through the valley. I'm going to walk. I'm going to see you through to the other side, right? We are truly, though, the hands and feet of Christ on this side of heaven. So we don't have to explain God's love in the midst of grief and loss. It's not the time for theodicy in the midst of grief and loss. Let me tell you what, 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 what this means and how God does. No, just be there. Be there with hugs and casseroles and phone calls and cards and, and meal trains and, and blankets and whatever it is that you need to be, be there. Even if you have no words to say, no words to say is better than not being there at all. We are the way that God comforts others in their grief. Um, and when I sign Bibles for confirmands and graduates, I always write something like, never stop asking questions. I, th 
think sometimes we think that God can't handle us wrestling with our faith, but I think it makes us better believers to ask these kinds of questions, to ask ourselves, to ask each other. I think it makes us better. I think it makes us stronger. Our oldest son used to say that knights in shining armor aren't the best knights because he'd trust a knight in armor that was a little beat up, battle scarred, because he knew that he'd gone through stuff and he'd come out the other side. And I think our faith is like that. It might sometimes be a little beat up. We might sometimes go, oh, you know what? Oh, am I a heretic for thinking that? What, what am I wrestling with? Do, God, what is that? Are you real? Whatever it is, God can handle that. God is bigger than our questions. So it was tough to answer all of these questions, and we probably left a lot unanswered, and we may have unearthed a whole bunch of other ones for you <laughs> as well. And if that's true for you, then come see one of us. Join a Bible study or a small group here. Join several Bible studies and several small groups here, right? Spend some time at the altar rail. Spend some time with a trusted friend or spend some time alone in your room wrestling with these questions. Get a journal. Pour out all these questions. Pour out all of your prayers. Because we've only scratched the surface of these half-truths as we point to the whole truth, which is our faith-seeking understanding. Amen? Amen. And amen.